today we'll be talking about the social and psychological impact of unemployment. And yeah, we all here are not necessarily employed, but we can unemployed, but we can find ourselves in that situation. And it's better to get the information now, know what we can know now and everything. So I'll just give Sarina uh, the platform. Sarina, you can take it away. Thank you, Blakey. I'm just gonna share my screen so long. Good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, I just want to confirm that you can see my uh, presenter view. Yes, you can see. Is that good? Yes, that's better. Okay. So good morning, everyone, again. Thank you so much for, to G for G for inviting me to speak. I'm very, very humble. Um, as Priti has said, that I've been tasked to speak to you today about the psychological and social impact of unemployment and understanding the situation more from an individualized perspective rather than um, something more broader. So I hope that's what comes through. So just as an overview, I think it's important to keep in mind that this isn't a discussion on, for example, how to get a job, but rather to understand what happens during periods of unemployment in order to recognize the complexity of it all and you know, to be able to make transformations that are positive when necessary. So it's not necessarily a problem solving space. Um, it's a more reflective one. So just to, um, to, you know, to, get a, to ensure that that's what you all understand is gonna to happen today. So I'm not sure of the ages of everyone today, but um, I'm sure that there's many of you that have been employed um, and, I'm, and I'm assuming I'm looking at a very young adult female population, but in whatever capacity, you know, something from a home industry perspective, uh, you know, selling things from home, baking and selling, helping uh, parents with businesses, things like waitressing, runner work. And if you think about the stress associated with being employed, specifically as a female, and, you know, culturally, um, as females, many of us have, you know, many roles and responsibilities associated um, with, with being female in, in a home. So even from a young age and from a cultural perspective, we are navigating so many different things at the same time. Um, and that's from an employed perspective, um, even if it is informal employment. Now, employment in whatever shape or form, and it's often, we think about employment from a traditional sense. It's seen as a very instrumental part of identity development. And the amount of pressure of, on young adolescents even from their high school years. For example, I've got a teenager who's at the moment choosing subjects. And these subjects are supposed to be what she chooses that determines the rest of her life. So it's um, or it's supposed to determine the rest of her life. So it's really important things happening with, with these adolescents. And more often than not, this is what will lead to the traditional sense of employment. Um, and obviously we see trends now in terms of employment changing. Um, where one can actually get work done. There's many times where in my capacity as I'm employed, I'll go sit at a coffee shop and do the work that I need to do. Um, but if you think about an adolescent brain, it's still very much developing from a neurobiological perspective, as well as emotional development and identity development. But we are conditioned from a very young age that being employed is seen as a construct, a part of almost of a health. So the converse would be true that unemployment suggests ill health. So ill health from a social perspective, from a mental perspective, from a physical perspective. Um, and I think back on myself um, as a young adult and um, I did a four year undergrad honors degree in occupational therapy. And one of the requirements thereafter is ComServe. So it's almost like a guaranteed year of employment. But towards the end of that year, it gets pretty crazy because everyone is trying to figure out where they are moving on to next, what job are they going to get to next. And it's, it's a period of extreme vulnerability because you, um, you, you're going on these interviews and it's almost hysterical in nature because you just want to get a job to be able to pay your bills. And I specifically, um, OT is mostly a female-led profession. And so if there are any males that are applying for similar jobs, the chances of a male getting a job over you is actually, you know, they have a better chance. And I, I know that's 
That's true in a lot of professions in terms of what we are seeing from a global scale. But specifically with a female-led profession, a male always has the upper hand. Um, so it's a very dodgy space of uncertainty. I remember being very overwhelmed, very anxious about you know, what, what to do next. Um, and there were long periods of time where I wasn't fully gainfully employed. And I think enhancing my, my studies in terms of po post-grad, um, you know, doing a master's, doing diplomas, it influenced my career trajectory um, in a very positive way. So I tried to think about it, um, you know, not being fully gainfully employed, but, you know, trying to kind of enhance myself um, so that when I get to, the, to a particular point or when I got to a particular point, I was more equipped. Additionally, employment is seen as almost the cornerstone of developing a lifestyle, you know, that has meaning, that has direction. It ha it's really loaded. So it's almost like a basis for self-respect. If you are employed, you are respectful in a, you know, a social situation. And being employed also suggests a valuable contribution to society, you know, economically. Think about if you are employed, you are getting your hair done, getting your nails done, you're buying coffee and sandwiches from the corner shop, um, you're taking transport, whether public or driving, you're taking vacations, using money that you've saved. So the fingers of being an employed person wave in all directions. And being unemployed means that people sit back and think, how am I actually contributing? Because we have been conditioned to think that employment equals leading a satisfactory life. Now, as an occupational therapist, one of the main occupations that we explore with people um, we work with, and in particular the sphere of work, is age and stage appropriateness and the link of other basic and instrumental activities of living. You know, the things that we do from the moment we wake up until the moment we go to sleep. Um, rest, sleep itself is considered an occupation. And impairment in the ability to work means that there is an impairment in the functioning of a person. So when you lose your job, it's not just losing a source of income, but it's also around personal work relationships that are lost, daily structures that are lost, and a very important sense of self-purpose. And unemployment can be, and often is, a shock to a person's system. And some of people respond to this, this shock quite instantaneously, and for others, it actually takes a bit of time. So you can experience some of these feelings and stresses, um, you know, as if you were seriously injured or going through a divorce or a mourning of someone. It's almost that type of loss um, because it's so loaded in terms of what being employed is. And you can go through all of this, in, as I said, in one go, or it can, you know, it can, can be more stagnated, but definitely has an influence on your social environment in terms of your, your um, you know, your close family, your extended family, your friends, you know, your social networking. I think also gender bias in terms of, um, again, as a, you know, being a female in a primarily male-led world, you know, you, you kind of, there's times where people are willing to take any job as opposed to being unemployed. And if you think about how vulnerable that actually makes a woman feel, um, and how almost disrespected because I'm doing this because I actually have to do it, but not because I'm passionate about it. So it's important things to think about. Um, I think the COVID pandemic as well has exposed these vulnerabilities even further when we think about how we have been challenged about what employment means versus being unemployed. Um, unemployment is a very important social determinant that highlights underlying health inequalities um, in our system. And I'm sure that Many of you, it can, you know, you can, um, it resonates with you, whether personally or someone you know, that when COVID happened, people were struggling financially because of employment status. Now, uh, I, I can't actually see, you know, participants here or anything like that, but I just want, this particular image for me was very loaded in considering the young adult population and the struggles that they are having in terms of, um, concept of being employed versus unemployed and what those roots actually look like going forward. So we do all this incredible work in terms of, um, you know, furthering our education and, you know, furthering our skill sets and still not always knowing where we are going forward with it. 
So in the chat box, maybe just take a second and just write one assumption that you potentially have about being unemployed, um, whether it's from a personal perspective or something that you've seen from the outside where someone you know might be unemployed. Um, you know, and just uh, you know, put that in the chat box and we can chat about that in a bit. So a recent editorial I read on the back of Youth Day, so it was around June, suggested that there's a very that this high rate of unemployment in the younger adult population is literally causing ill health in the younger adult age group. So speaking from the perspective of a health professional, the concept of unemployment is not just a social or an economic construct, but it's increasingly becoming a health problem. And I'll speak about that, you know, more as more specifically. But what this means is that the influence of unemployment is reaching into the adjusted lifespan of a human being um, because work appears to often define people who have this notion of being employed means having success. So when the concept of unemployment is combined with lack of educational opportunities or leisure engagement or just overall facilitation from society, the result is potentially a very disengaged young adult population who are becoming more and more physically and mentally ill. And they're also engaging in more types of risky behaviors because they, have the, they, ha they don't have the ability to resolve the crisis of identity development that is associated with being employed. So what I mean by this is that there's a particular theorist called Eric Erickson who speaks to the concept of identity development versus role confusion in the adolescent population and how resolving that crisis and developing identity is instrumental to actually moving on to the next stage of adulthood. So if we see what our young adults are experiencing from an employment versus unemployment perspective, there's a lot of crisis going on if there is uncertainty about um, being employed. So physical consequences of, of being unemployed. So um, stress-related illnesses. So if you actually look at it, the younger population are experiencing things like high blood pressure, stroke, heart attack, heart disease, diabetes, all of that potentially resultant from being unemployed and the stress associated with being unemployed. I also very strongly believe that gender analysis is very important when it comes to considering unemployment and the consequences of, of, of unemployment. So if you think about a female and how a female could respond physically to being unemployed, it's very different to a male experience. Many females even um, report issues with fertility because of the stress of not being in a gainfully or fully or happily involved space. space. Um, and if you think about a, a household, if there's an unemployed male versus an unemployed female in the home, the roles of the female, that doesn't change. You still need to do what you need to do. And as I said, from a cultural perspective, many of us actually experience that. So you still have to do what you need to do and, the, and have everything magnified by actually being unemployed during that time. So the clothes need to be washed and the food needs to be cooked and the house needs to be cleaned. And you are also sitting there unemployed with this immense stress. Um, but just to understand that the physical consequences are often associated with chronic diseases of lifestyle, like what I've mentioned. And this inevitably contributes to the burden of disease long-term because if our younger population are becoming ill, that means that they are taking, that illness, taking those illnesses into their older adulthood stages that actually has the potential to reduce a person's lifespan. Um, so health damaging behaviors as well. We can't speak about physical consequences without commenting on risky behaviors that are associated. Um, people are more inclined um, to have positive uh, negative outcomes in terms of uh, substance use. And that's one of uh, my areas of main interest within my profession is addiction. Um, they're most likely to engage in risky behavior like that. They're more likely to have unhappy marriages. They are more likely to, um, you know, partake in things like gambling um, as, you know, in a desperate state. Um, so all of these things are important to consider. 
And looking at the psychological distress, this is just an overview, and I'm going to go into this uh, in a little bit more depth in a few minutes, but basically you're looking at psychological distress in terms of an overall decline in life satisfaction when one is unemployed. So not just, um, you know, not being able to, to have a, a salary at the end of the month, but what it actually means for quality of life in terms of your meaning and your purpose. Fatigue is often associated with this job seeking, uh, be, you know, when you are looking for a job and you just can't seem to find a job, and what that actually does to you from a distress perspective. Mental illness, again, just like physical illness, once you have a mental illness, that is something chronic, it's lifelong. You don't get cured from a mental illness, you go into recovery when it comes to a mental illness. And having a mental illness is often very much associated with um, isolation and feeling alone, stigma, shame of being unemployed. I mean, sitting in a family gathering, what do you do for a living? And having to say, I'm actually not working at the moment. That's not something that easy, easily ro rolls off the tongue. So I'm going to speak about the mental, um, mental uh, effects in a bit. Um, now, stigma. Um, and this is what I mean by when you're sitting in a family gathering and you have to say, I don't have a job. I'm not working at the moment. Important here to consider is that stigma is probably the most notable social consequence of being unemployed. And it's perhaps the most crippling as well because of the label of being unemployed. Because how often have you heard people even say, how am I supposed to gain experience if they say I have no experience and then no one will give me a job? So, you know, it's, it's almost that culmination of, I feel like giving up because I don't want to be part of the stigma that is attached to being unemployed. Or someone who has this beautiful degree and is now doing home industry work because they actually can't get a job, feeling less because that home industry job is not as, you know, superb as working as a CEO somewhere. Now, with regards to stigma, when you think about it from an individual perspective, it's actually a very intricate and complex psychological process because individuals in, respond to the stigma by stigmatizing themselves. So it, it, it's, it's really, it's almost like a vice versa type of situation. If someone is um, stigmatizing you for being unemployed, you then de develop almost self-stigma um, that results in really detrimental um, cognitive deficits, things like poor motivation, uh, poor self-concept, poor self-esteem, because you feel lesser than within your society. Interpersonal stigma is that interaction that I'm talking about in terms of um, someone stigmatizing you. And structural stigma is often uh, speaking about how people are restricted in terms of the opportunities within society as a result of being unemployed. So you almost um, detached from it and alienated from certain opportunities as a result of being unemployed. And it creates a bias. It's difficult to alleviate, it's difficult to shape because once someone is known to be unemployed, then it's almost like people are waiting for the person to either get a job or stay unemployed. And that bias that's created around, well, what's wrong with you? Why can't you get a job? I have a job. Uh, we both have the same profession, we both studied the same thing, like what's going on here. So I'm going to task you quickly for five minutes. Um, I want you to look at the last 10 to 15 pictures on your camera roll, and I'm going to stop my share here, um, just so that we can maybe engage a little bit. And I want you to identify a picture in those 10 to 15 pictures in your camera roll. So screenshots don't count. If you've got exam timetables, those types of things. I'm talking about pictures that you've actually taken or pictures that have been taken of you. And I want you to identify one picture that illustrates your most fulfilling occupation or engagement in life at the moment. Something that brings you joy, something that gives you meaning, something that makes you happy. And it can be something totally concrete, like a plate of food that you've cooked because you enjoy cooking and it gives you purpose for the day or something a little bit more abstract in terms of maybe you've taken a photo of a sunrise because you, want, you go for walks in the morning. So you can decide on that. I'm going to put a timer on for five minutes, and then I'm hoping we can just get a little bit of engagement because there's a few participants in, in, um, in the session, so I'm sure we can have a bit of a chat. Okay, is that good with everyone? Yes. Okay.
Um, Zarina. Yep. Yep. When I find the picture, we should write on the chat box which picture. No, I'm is hoping it? I'm hoping we can actually share camera for the pictures. Oh, okay. If you if um um if it's possible to share, if people are on their phones, then they can just put it into the chat box. Yeah. Okay. I also just want to comment on, on the chats that I hear uh, around my first question um, earlier on in the presentation. And I don't know if everyone's read it, but even if you read these very few that have been put up, can you see how absolutely loaded and heavy the feeling of being unemployed is? And if you think about you know, everything I've discussed so far. So thanks everyone who, who um, contributed to that. Okay, so time is going much quicker than I anticipated. So I think I will be using more time, Preeti. Um, but um, I'm seeing some nice stuff here. I'm loving what I'm seeing. Dancing at the gym, sitting in the library, a picture of my friend and I painting the town red, a picture of a drawing I drew, um, a picture of me leaving the salon after doing my hair, and a picture of me and my dad's maid flaunting our beauty. And if you, if you look at that, you'll see, I, I don't know if anyone in particular wants to share something. I'll share mine really quickly. Um, I'm just gonna put my camera off first. Uh, this was mine. I don't know if you guys can see it, but I go for walks in the morning. Oh, it's not focusing. Um, so I go for walks in the morning and I always take pictures of, of what I see because a picture of me teaching my Sunday school class, a video of my outfit of the day while getting ready in the morning. So you'll see that a lot of what you highlighted is something that really gives meaning. It gives you purpose. It makes you feel like you are contributing not only to society, I mean, society, okay, but to yourself. You are enhancing yourself. You are enriching yourself. Um, I know someone said sitting at the library and it's, it seems mundane, but sitting in that library is going to contribute so significantly to your trajectory going forward, just like everything else that's been highlighted. So I'm gonna carry on with my screen share. Um, and you just have to tell me again if, uh, if it's the right one. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So I want you um, to think we about- We can see your notes. Okay, so that's what I want you to actually just, to just tell me now. Um, now? Um. It hasn't responded. So I just, um, I'm having a bit of a complication with my screen share. Now 
now? Yes, back to normal. It's, um, I usually teach as well, but for some reason today, my screens are all um, mixed up. So one of, the, one of the things I want you to hold on to is the things that you highlighted from your pictures, right? And I've decided to, to look at unemployment in terms of the stages of grief um, and to situate this within those stages of grief. So those of you who do know around Kubler-Ross's theory, um, you know, some of you might be familiar with it, but it's around unemployment as a grieving process. And when we speak about unemployment, it's unemployment after job loss or after a job seeking process, because both can be very draining. Both can be um, so complex in, in what it does to you internally. And this is especially poignant because given the magnitude of what everyone has actually experienced in the past year, you know, when considering something like COVID, the loss of employment, you know, whether losing a job with an employer or, you know, being someone who has to close down a business, it's crushed lots and lots of souls. And the purpose of grief, the process of grief is a necessary process because it helps us to reawaken and almost reweave a life that has really been shaken for whatever reason that has caused the grief. And today I'm going to talk about unemployment being that thing that causes the grief. So one of the main reasons that there's a struggle with unemployment is the loss of structure, the loss of purpose, and the loss of meaning. It's the loss of social networks, the steady paycheck, a predictable routine. Think about what happens when someone is unemployed. What actually goes through that person's routine? Waking up in the morning, you know, taking a shower at an appropriate time, um, eating your breakfast, all of those types of things are severely impacted by being unemployed. So we look at the first stage um, called denial. And this is often an internal dialogue. In the space of denial, people are not always willing to express what's going on. They, it's, it's very um, covert in nature. It's very passive aggressive at times. And it's almost like you sitting there telling yourself, I'm going to be fine. It's going to be okay. I'll figure this out. It, it's okay. It's a space of the, realizing the uncertainty of the future as well. So you go through that whole, I'll be fine. And then you go through I'm actually not going to be fine. I don't know what's going to happen. And so one can almost deny the existence of a future without a job. Like do people either accept it, you know, like I don't know what's going to happen here or they go through this process. Lots of questioning, lots of reflection and lots of difficulty with accepting one's space. Everyone experiences this differently, but overall denial is about the difficulty to accept. Um, this future um, that's so unpredictable, okay? And then anger. This is where the stress starts to creep in, you know, and this can be, you know, we spoke about the physical and the mental effects that I, I, I discussed earlier. And this is where things start to manifest because now you start looking at things from a more pragmatic perspective. What is going to actually happen forward? And this looks different in different people based on their personality. Some people become very irrational, you know, very impulsive, you know, almost do stupid things. Um, some people have a very quiet rage. Um, they are upset, but like I said, it's not manifesting as anger in the traditional sense because it's more covert. The bottom line is the stress levels are high. So everyone is experiencing these stress levels differently. And often in this stage, there's an absolute depletion of coping mechanisms. So any coping mechanism that you had in place to deal with stress in life in general starts to get depleted and almost becomes fully depleted, resulting in those irrational things and that in, or those impulsive things that you might do. Um, a very basic example is like if you're someone who's employed and you, you get your hair done once, once a month, you still do that. Um, even though you don't have the money, you are maxing out credit cards, but it's like, no, it's, it's going to be okay because um, I'm going to, I should be taking care of myself as well. It's self-care um, and I'll get a job eventually. 
going to be okay, but you, you actually engaging in some risky stuff from a financial perspective. Um, and that's, you know, examples of maladaptive coping, poor self-esteem, just not feeling good about yourself um, because of, remember, we spoke about the stigma. So just to keep in mind, the anger manifests differently. It's more overt in some people and males tend to be more overt. They tend to be more aggressive versus females that have a, we have a tendency because we are nurturers by, um, by instinct. It's almost primordial. We don't want other people to worry about us. So our anger is more repressed, but it does come out eventually. Then you get to bargaining. And this is where you are trying to fit the pieces together. And this bargaining you could be doing with yourself, you could be doing with your higher power. You could also be doing it in a very, um, uh, not a very overt manner with people in your life. Because you're starting to understand the trajectory a little bit more. You're starting to move a little bit more towards accepting, but you're still weighing pros and cons with yourself, with others. When we lose a job, as I said, it impacts our social environment, it impacts everyone around us. And so this stage is about just trying to regain a locus of control. Um, we are trying to gain power in terms of mitigating that stress from the previous stage, but there's still powerlessness associated with bargaining. It's very overwhelming because you're actually not completely certain about what you are bargaining, okay? And then you go into the next stage that is a, just straight up depression. And that's, I'm not making that up, it's from the stages of grief. And the reason that this stage is so volatile is because this could potentially be a detachment stage. And if it's managed incorrectly, it has devastating long-term effects. Because like I said, the development of a mental illness is not something that goes away. It is something that puts you into a recovery process and it's something that's often lifelong and something that has to be managed properly. So that long-term effect of staying too long in this particular stage is actually quite um, devastating. And this is especially important because one's judgment is compromised in, in the clutches of a depression. There's limited motivation for pursuits. There's often difficulty in decision-making. Um, and obviously, the actual depression diagnosis, associated anxiety that comes along. In this stage, you're not always being yourself. And like I said, females have a tendency to repress a lot um, in our uh, need to nurture and to take care of other people. Exhaustion is common because there's a depletion of resources, whether it's the coping mechanisms, whether it's financially, your savings are being used up whether it's, you know, what you are experiencing with your, um, you know, within your social environment, if you are in relationships, if you have children. And it's very important to know what to look out for. Recognizing this is very important because it's valid emotions and it's valid experiences, but it is our responsibility in terms of um, being self-directed that we are able to recognize the signs and symptoms of what's going on with us and understand associated resources that are available to us, okay? So just to quickly go through the signs and symptoms, and if anybody wants any additional information about this, you're most welcome to contact me or we can have a bit of a chat just now. But these are the types of things that you need to look out for when it comes to things like depression, okay? And many of them I've already highlighted. And if you actually look at them, is it not expected when you are in such a stressful situation to experience things like this? So my disclaimer is, I'm not saying if you're unemployed, you're gonna become depressed. I'm saying these are symptoms that you need to look out for in order to contain yourself properly and heal yourself properly so as to not take this further into a diagnosable mental illness that has long-term repercussions on yourself and your um, social environments and how you engage in, in all your other occupations in life, okay? Then you get to the stage, the final stage, which is acceptance. Here, you, you just, you're able to somehow situate that puzzle piece a little bit better. And here is where the development of the locus of control happens to some extent. 
And it can be something tangible and it can be something abstract. It's something like, let's say you lost your job and you came home with a box of your stuff and you left the box in a corner and that was just, you just left it there and it's been four months since you even looked at it. Just taking that box out and unpacking it, you know, putting things away, throwing certain things away, going through some documentation can be a tangible manifestation of you gaining a little bit of control of the situation. More abstract, it might just be some sort of reasoning that occurs in your head around your trajectory and where you're moving forward. So let's say you have this work-seeking fatigue and it's, you've been going through this grieving process and you get to a space where you think, I can actually do something else. I don't actually want to, to, to be in that type of employment anymore. I want to try something a little bit more contemporary. I have these skill sets beyond my degree that can contribute towards my life financially. So it can be something abstract and it can be something tangible when it comes to this part of acceptance. And here it's about the ability to recognize your own strengths, your own limitations, what brings you meaning, what brings you purpose. Um, and you know, it's almost like you, you ready yourself to leave the incident, to leave the process of being unemployed and move forward, not leave it behind because you should never leave experiences behind because they, they make you who you are. All your experiences lead you to a space of resilience. And so experiences in any capacity, not just unemployment, should never be left behind. It's just about taking a step forward from the experience and understanding where you're going beyond that. I also want to say you can't do this alone. And may, again, it's a female thing. We want to fix our stuff alone because we don't want other people to worry about us to the extent that we won't even tell our besties about certain things because we don't want to worry them and we don't want to burden them because everyone's got their own burden. I, I personally feel as a clinician, as an educator, that people's narratives are the most precious thing that they can give to you and that you can enter into. And sometimes it's not about advice giving because that's what we tend to default to again as females because we want to fix stuff. It's often about just hearing people and giving them safe spaces for reflection. And you need to understand that you are valuable enough and your experience is valid enough for someone else to hear your experience. So it's very important that within this grieving process, you don't do it alone. You find support systems that can enhance how you go through this process of grieving. So just some very basic suggestions. As I said, this is not a problem solving space or how to get a job, how to stay employed forever, but just some suggestions around what you can think about in relation to everything I've spoken about this morning, going forward, should someone ever find themselves in a space of unemployment. Something as basic as sticking to a routine. I don't know how many of you experienced it during COVID. Um, you know, when we're in hard lockdown, university students especially, I mean, I work with university students every day. The number of students that come to class, class, Zoom class, literally have just woken up. If you just say cameras on, they literally are sitting in their beds, leery eyed, and they have just gotten up because routine has been messed up so much. And one of the things that kept me in routine was the fact that I woke up in the morning early and I took a shower and I put actual clothes on. I refused to sit in pajamas um, every day because that was part of my routine, okay? So enhancing your job skills. The number of online sites that allow for free engagement is, is actually alarming. There's so many of them. Um, use your networks. G4G is your network. It's your tribe. It's why you are here. Um, Find out, don't be afraid to ask. Um, don't, don't, don't get smothered by the stigma, I want to say. Ask, you don't know what's happening out there. You don't know who you could be assisting. Um, you, know, you don't know where you could actually be moving in terms of the trajectory. And avoid personalizing rejection. I think one of the most difficult things we experience, especially again, as females is that, and, and it is a, um, a limitation that we have to all recognize and actually be aware of, is that if someone has feedback for us, it's seen as a personal attack and it becomes internalized. 
to the extent that it can be quite um, uh, disabling. Avoid seeing that rejection as something personal. It could be for any number of reasons that you are unemployed, um, whether by losing your job or um, not being able to get a job and seek help where necessary. So like I said, with those signs and symptoms, when you are experiencing stress levels, when you are experiencing depressive symptoms, when you're experiencing anxiety, go and look for the resources where you can find help. There's so many NGOs, NPOs as well. Um, at university level, student support, I know there's a lot of criticism around student support that I, my own students have, um, have highlighted we have to keep trying and, and seeking help when necessary is actually really important to be able to, um, to resolve a lot of the conflicts that come out as a result of being unemployed. And that's my time, guys. Thank you, Zarina. That was very insightful. Yes, we learned a lot today. I just realized well, it's better to go through a situation when you actually understand what is it that you're going through rather than just being there. Sure. Yeah, sure. I guess Alice will take the questions. Uh, I don't see any questions um, in the chat box. But if anyone does have a question, please do um, raise your hand and then you can take a question. Or if you're comfortable, you can put it onto the chat. Um, but I have a question um, for myself. I and mean, then I also see Bonolo has ha raised her hand. Um, so we can start with Bonolo and then I can ask my question now. Bonolo? Okay, thank you so much, um, Alicia. Um, so, Zainab, am I pronouncing your name correct? Zarina. Um, so Zarina, I was going through your presentation. And I'm definitely one who did go through the unemployment process and everything. And I'm an actress and I'm happy and life's great. And I also actually did have depression, but I had clinical depression. And do you really think it's not possible to like cure depression? Because I feel like my depression was hectic. And now maybe as you say, because of routine and stuff, I really don't think or feel de ever depressed. I feel like I have bad days, but it's never like a crippling depression to the extent that I used to have. Um, so when you say that you can't ever go past depression, what exactly do you mean by that? No, I didn't say you couldn't get past depression. I said that it is a lifelong recovery process. So the okay. Fact that, that you are feeling well means that you are well situated within your recovery process based on whatever coping mechanisms you've, been, you've put in place to enhance your participation in your life. So you might have experienced the space where you were um, going through certain signs and symptoms and you might have to be medicated and you might have to go for counseling. But the, the, the concept of relapse is a very real thing. And, okay. and, and as I said, you might be in a space that, that is productive for you versus someone else who still actively struggles consistent, consistently. So with a clinical diagnosis like depression, and that was my dis disclaimer when I spoke about it, is that when you're unemployed, you're not necessarily depressed. You just have depressive symptoms that have to be managed. With a clinical diagnosis, you actually are in a lifelong recovery process and relapse is a very real possibility. Oh my gosh, that's so scary. I'm so bleak that you said that, but thanks for the check. <laughs> no, I don't Thank think it's, it's around being bleak. I think it's just around having insight into how volatile life actually is. And that yeah. we always need to be very self-aware of what's going on inside of us and you know, internally from an emotional and a mental and a physical health perspective in order to be able to identify and recognize when we need to um, make changes that, are, that okay. are going to be productive and have positive outcomes. So well done to you. You know, being in this process is very hectic and finding a space of such um, happiness and strength is actually a very incredible thing to do. Um, Thank so you more, so much. More power to you. It's God, it's God. Thank you it so is, much. And this has is. been an absolutely amazing session. I'm so grateful that I came. There's so I'm much so that happy. I can relate to. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Manolo. Um, we have Arafilwa in the chat. She's asking, 
how do we go about this stigmatizing unemployment in our communities? I think that's one of the, the most um, crippling things that we deal with specifically from a cultural perspective. I can't stress that enough um, because at, uh, many of our cultures associate being employed with being happy, with being um, fulfilling, and with being contributing members of society. Mm -hmm. And so destigmatizing unemployment primarily is about educating people, educating our communities, saying it out loud. And I don't think there's enough going on within our communities in terms of workshops, for example. And what's really scary in terms of stigma for me is that, you know, you see it in the older population, you know, when they talk about, um, you know, you have to get a job because, because why do we get jobs? Many of us from a cultural perspective get jobs to be able to contribute towards our family. Many of us get degrees and many of us are like the first or second people in the family to get degrees because we need to contribute towards families and, and communities. And so if we are unemployed, are you useful to this family or community? What have you been doing all of this for? And so I think we need to educate people around people. Don't, the, the common person does not know what the unemployment rates are. If I have to ask you guys now, and I only know this because I looked it up last night on the Department of Labor website. If I had to ask you what our unemployment rates actually are, you wouldn't be able to tell me because we actually don't know what's going on out there. And so we, we almost can't fault people for not understanding what's going on from an unemployment perspective and the crisis that is being experienced within our country specifically. Um, but it's about, for me, hardcore. When it comes to things like mental illness, things like stigma, it's about educating people. We need to be creating the spaces out there to say we want to talk about this particular topic and have a bunch of people like today, you know, have a bunch of people come and sit down and listen um, and be educated around what stigma actually is and how it makes people feel. Um, because people are often, they don't take cognizance of what they, the words and what experiences can do to contribute towards people's ill health overall. Thank you. Um, Pretty has her hand raised as well. Yes. Just to confirm what thing about me. what thing is I can't hear you. There's a there's someone who's not being yeah, sorry. I was saying, um, just to confirm on what we are talking about now, what do you think places more pressure on an unemployed individual? Is it the things around us or is it the fact that, okay, I'm unemployed, I don't have a source of income? Just say again, Priti, I missed the first part of your question. Okay, so, um, what do you think pressures unemployed individuals, the stigmas around us, or is it the fact that you are unemployed or you don't have a source of income? So I think that's very individualized. For example, my personality is such that if I'm unemployed, I don't care what anyone else thinks about me. That's my problem. It's my family's problem. Mm -hmm. I have to deal with it. Whereas you might have someone else um, who, who actually, and like I said, because culturally it has so much of significance in terms of if you are employed, you are actually successful. The stigma will cripple them more than the actual stress of being unemployed. So that's, a, I think, a very individualized experience. And it could go both ways where someone is, is feeling, and think about a person who is feeling the extreme pressure of the stigma on top of not having enough money you know, to pay rent at the end of the month. Um, so I do believe, and I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts around that based on the experiences that they've had, but for me, it's very much individualized. It's very much personality-based because how we respond to, stress, to stressful situations is in fact personality-based as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Serena. Agashula has a follow-up question. She's asking, do you think that lo the looting and the um, social unrest uh, that happened in the past few weeks may have also been an outburst of anger 
from the unemployed? I think, uh, I think the people within our country have reached breaking point. And I don't want to comment too much on it from a political perspective or you know, go into economics around it because that's not my field of, of strength. But I think that you know, we spoke about the stress, the depression, the anxiety, the worry. People can only take so much. And so if you have large groups of people who are saying, we cannot do this anymore, then inevitably there's going to be a breaking point. And I think during that period, it, it, there, was, there was the breaking point and it manifested so chaotically and so viciously, um, you know, looking from the outside. But if you have to actually, and like I said, I, I believe people's narratives are the most precious thing in the world. And if you had to speak to people who had been, you know, part of that, you would get a different side through the story. And, and so I think that everything that we see from a, um, I don't want to say political, but from a societal perspective in terms of the negatives of society is as a result of people's stress levels being taken to such a level that they, they actually can't um, stay within the norms. And I say norms in terms of what society has deemed to be norms. Mm. Mm. And then we have a question from Akutwe. Mm. She says that you've spoken about um, not personalizing rejection, mm. but how do you manage or navigate the emotions that come with being constantly rejected? Yeah. So, like I said, when I uh, got towards the end of my community service year, um, I can't tell you how many interviews I went on. <laughs> at how many hospitals. I just acutely remember buying a, uh, a suit and I, and I went on these, on these interviews, um, rejected over and over and over again. It must've been about five or six hospitals. Um, and I, I really believe that maturity um, influences your ability to deal with, um, with rejection and not personalizing rejection. If it happens, if you end up personalizing the rejection, that's why I mentioned the importance of coping mechanisms, of self-esteem, of self-concept. You need to think about the ways in which you can enhance those concepts in order to um, almost uh, compartmentalize the professional rejection. Um, because that is what it is at the end of the day. It's a professional rejection based on a set of criteria you potentially could, didn't meet or someone met better than you. And obviously there's a lot of other dynamics involved in that. You've got things like nepotism and all of those things that influence you, whether you get a job or not. But I think it's important to compartmentalize that aspect because your personal self is who you are. And it's a beautiful self. And each one of us are so unique and so amazing. And we have so much to con contribute. So even if it's something like giving back to your society while being unemployed, volunteering at an animal shelter or an old age home, something that makes you feel like you are actively contributing towards your society, even though you're unemployed, because to, we've been conditioned to think the only way we can contribute is actually by being employed and contributing to um, economics. Um, but doing something to, to give back, to enhance your self-esteem, to enhance your self-concept, to in, in, enhance your motivation to actually want to continue, um, you know, your personal can actually influence your professional in a very good way and, and, um, and vice versa. But compartmentalizing is very important when it comes to the difference between professional rejection and a personal attack. And like I said, that comes with maturity. It comes with talking. It comes with reflecting. It comes with um, trusting uh, people in safe spaces. And I think we need to be actually creating more of these spaces. I think Zoom has opened up a world for us. Um, and if we can get together in groups of six or seven, you know, and sit down and talk about our experiences for an hour, everyone's going to feel, leave feeling with such a sense of universality in terms of someone else is also experiencing this, I'm not alone. Um, so I really think it's important to, when you navigate this, to be able to delineate between what is, what is the rejection about 
is it about my personality or is it because a sort of criteria wasn't met? Thank you, Zarina. And then I just have last question. Um, how can we um, better support a loved one, whether it's a friend or a family member who may be um, unemployed um, without making them feel even worse about the situation that they're in? Yes. And, and, and it's so hard to navigate that because when you, when you know someone is unemployed, for, for example, there's a, a time period where my husband was unemployed. And it's so difficult to navigate because you sometimes just don't know what to say. You, and, and sometimes you say the wrong thing and it becomes quite explosive because you didn't mean this, but this is how the person interpreted it. I think it's just around, if you have a relationship with that person, um, that is you know a close relationship with that person, it's about saying to them, and not avoid first and foremost avoid advice giving do not give advice reflection is the most it's the most important tool in your bag of tricks when it comes to navigating this if someone is talking to you you don't have to be giving them advice all the time you just need to listen to them give them a safe space that's the really important and if they feel safe in your space whatever their needs are will come out um, but picking at the scab, trying to dig out and unearth something that someone is not willing to give you just yet can actually have detrimental impacts on the relationship itself. So, for example, when I've had friends who have been unemployed, I'll, I might just randomly say, um, listen, um, I have this amount of money uh, that I can uh, contribute to help you with. If you need it, let me know. And then if they do need it, they'll let me know. So that's something more pragmatic because I'm a very practical person. Um, on the other hand, I might phone the person and say, listen, how are things going, whatever, whatever. And if they feel like they need to reflect with you, then they will. But I think if we can work on ourselves, each and every one of us as individuals, and how we can create our safe, how we can be safe spaces for other people, people will come to us with what their needs are. But advice giving is very dangerous to do because it suggests empathy that you might not actually have because you might not know what it's like to be in that situation and then it becomes more volatile and confrontational. Mm -hmm. That makes so much sense. And then we have a question um, from Yusra Adams. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing the name incorrectly. She says, um, you've spoken about reflection how do you think we as individuals can go about starting that process? I think the first thing that you do when you are allowing someone a space for reflection is to let them talk. And it sounds like such, an, um, it's such a dirt moment kind of thing, but it actually is very really important because if you actually monitor yourself in conversations, many of us interject constantly. We don't actually provide people with spaces to talk we actually want to also hear our own voices sometimes. And when, we, when giving people spaces for reflection, we need to actually listen to them. Another thing is when someone is talking to you, a, a key aspect of reflection is to sometimes say the stuff that they've said back to them just in a different way. So paraphrasing. So if someone is talking about how difficult it is and how hard it's been at home, all you do is, Say something like, so it sounds like things are very hectic at the moment and that you're struggling. Rather than put in new ideas or prompt the person, you actually just hear what they say and kick it back to them. Because when, when something is kicked back to you, you instantly feel validated. And if you can go about the process of constantly validating people who are experiencing this type of crisis, it actually really works well to boost their self-esteem, to enhance their motivation. Um, you know, to, to get them a little bit more going in terms of their decision-making and their judgment. Um, but I think the most important thing when it comes to reflection is to allow for safe spaces to let people talk, to not interject constantly and not to give advice. Right, and and not to give advice unless asked. No? So not give advice unless asked. Unless asked. 
So you will have people who will say to you, what do you think I should do? And then in the back of your head, you've got 16 ideas. So pitch two to them and say, what about this and what about this? All right, if there aren't any questions um, from the ladies, yeah. I think I'll hand back over to Pretty. Yes, thank you, Zerina, for that. That was very insightful. I guess the ladies can agree with me that we learned a lot today. And if there's anything else, if there's nothing else, I think we can call it to quits. <laughs>